Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are you who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For you shall be filled. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are those who are mourners, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are you who are the peacemakers, for you shall be called the children of God. And blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for you kingdom of heaven. Well, good morning and welcome to part four of this series that we're in right now called Kingdom Come. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this series is all about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We celebrate at Christmas a king is born. And what we're doing is taking a look at Jesus' world-famous Sermon on the Mount to understand a little bit better, a little bit more clearly, what his kingdom is was all about. Don't worry, there is not going to be a test on this material afterwards. Many of you, that is done and over with. Congratulations. Uh, but in case you would like to look back at the previous first three parts, they will be available on our media player, EncounterChurch.org slash messages. Uh, last week, I just got to say, something pretty cool happened. Uh, in case you weren't with us last week, the message was all about the worry and the anxiety that we can't help but bring with us a lot of the time. And, uh, and I had no idea. I didn't know this ahead of time. It was not planned this way. I would love to take credit for it, but in all honesty, I just can't. But that message about anxiety and about worry and about how we don't have to have the how of how it's all going to happen when we have the who, right? We've got a guy for that who's got the who. We have to know the who, and he has the how. It's a little bit like a Dr. Seuss book, but that's, that's okay. Remember, that message about worry and anxiety, for many of you, that came like the week of and the week before exams. And so I heard about like many of you finishing off papers and projects and studying for tests as we did our cafe day where we had about 150 people, students like fill every square inch of this building, cramming everything in and you just like shared with me about what God spoke to you during that uh, message last week. And I just thought that was so cool and thank you for sharing it with me. I'd love to take credit, but that I believe was a divinely orchestrated plan and not at all my own doing. Today we're going to um, take a look at prayer. And what I'd like to do this morning is to give you a, a life hack or maybe a prayer hack about how is it that you can pray with 100% effectiveness. A lot of people say that you can't bat a thousand, but I think if we follow the teaching of Jesus today that we can actually pray and know that we are heard by God every single time. But as we kind of move into this time, I want to give you a little bit of a heads up of who this message is not for. This message this morning is not for those of you who have no problem and whose mind never wanders when you sit down and when you pray at night, in the morning, or during the day. This message is not for any of you who wonder whether or not your prayers can actually like clear the ceiling of your living room and they're not getting any farther beyond than just that. This message this morning is not for those of you who forget to pray or forget things when you're praying. This message is not for those few of you who maybe just a little bit this much start to doze off and fall asleep when you intend to be praying instead. If that's you, like you can take the next 20 minutes off, you're good. You should, in fact, be on stage giving the presentation today because you've got it all figured out, like you know. But for the rest of us, and because I already have the mic all wired up, I'm just going to kind of continue, if that's all right. But I want you to know something, that this is that this applies to me as well, that this is for me as well. I am not one of those people that just doesn't need it. We talk about things like, we talk about things like forgetting to pray. Sometimes I have the experience where like after worship on Sunday at some point, like somebody will come up and they'll offer like, I'm in a season of this, that, or the other thing, or I've got a job interview this week or a test result coming back. Would you pray for me? And I'll, I'll tell you what happens. Is sometimes in those moments, I just, I sit there and I say, can we pray right now? And they're like, they're like, I thought you'd just do it later. But like, 
right? And so we pray together right there in that moment. And I know what happens because I can hear you as you walk away. There's this comment or this sense of like, man, that Dirk, he is such a super spiritual person. I can't even believe it. Not at all. Not the truth. I'm not a super spiritual person. I just know me. And I know that I'm going to forget if I don't do it right then and there. Because I'm the guy who forgets. I'm the guy I'm the guy that just a little bit, maybe this much, falls asleep when I intend to be praying. I'm the guy who wonders whether my prayer is going to clean the ceil- clear the ceiling. I'm the guy whose mind wanders when I'm supposed to be focusing on things of God and praying for the people that I, would, I told that I would be praying. A true story is a couple of weeks ago, um, I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to like um, preach on this stuff, I better start to implement it. And I thought, here, here's what I'm going to do as a, as a new discipline. I'm going to I'm going to make a new habit and pray. Like, first thing, as soon as that alarm goes off, I'm going to pray before my feet even hit the ground. All right? So, like, I'm going to hit that snooze. I'm going to pray until the next snooze or until I get out of bed in the morning. It's going to be great, life-changing, habit-forming, all that stuff. Keystone habit. You read the book. Okay, so I'm going to, you know, alarm goes off, and I wake up, and I'm like, God bless this day, right? God, be in all those moments throughout the day. God, may every appointment be a divine appointment, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In Jesus' name, amen. And then I look at my phone, and I'm not kidding. The first thing I saw that morning after I said amen was that I had missed an appointment that I was supposed to be at. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And that's about how that went. Uh, it's for me today, as well as many of you, I think. And so I want to say, now that I've shot all my credibility whatsoever, it's a good thing that we're not going to hear about prayer, we're not going to hear about teaching from my thoughts or my habits, but we're actually going to go to the source. We're going to go to the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount as he's going to teach us how to pray. Someone once said that learning about prayer from Jesus is a lot like learning about investment advice from Warren Buffett. You might not know what everything means all the time, but it's probably worth writing a few things down along the way so you can figure out what they mean at a later point. Jesus found prayer, this prayer, in fact, so important, he actually preached on it twice. And we know it was twice because it was a little bit different each time. And so he thought, hey, it's so important, I want to make sure to get this out there and get my people praying. In Luke chapter 11, which is where we're not going, we're going to Matthew chapter 6, but in Luke chapter 11, according to Luke, Jesus tells the, one of the times when he taught uh, how to pray. And he, uh, the disciples, it's written down in Luke that Jesus sat down, right, and he was, he was praying, and then he said, amen. And I just believe there was kind of like this hanging moment of awkwardness after he got done praying. And Jesus maybe, like, looks at his disciples and is like, you know, I got, like, hummus in my beard. Like, what's, why are you staring at me like that? And one of the disciples looks at him and he says, Lord, would you teach us how to pray which I just think that like, is, is such an important li- like little moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples because in that moment, the disciples realized, Jesus, it's something about the way you pray and about the way that we pray that's just different. Jesus, it just kind of seems like your prayers, you get a little higher than our prayers. Jesus, would you teach us to pray like you pray? And Jesus, of course, in that moment, he says, yes. And so we want to go to the place in Matthew chapter 6, starting off in verse 5. If you, uh, if you want to follow along in a paper Bible, Bible classic, as we call them, they're underneath the, the chairs in front of you, but the words are also going to be on the screen behind me in uh, phone-friendly church, so you can follow along that way. Matthew 6, 5 says, hey, Jesus now, and when you pray, which is like, right, not if, not when you do it right, but all the time when you pray, so we're going to leave that right there, Don't be like one of the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, I'm just going to venture out a guess here to say that the issue for many of us today is not resisting the temptation to go out to 28th Street and the East Beltline and pray so everybody can see us. Just kind of like guessing that when you think in your mind, you know, I just love to store up a few Jesus points or jewels in my crown, whatever you call it. Uh, that's how I'm going to do it. I don't think that's how it's going to work. I think for many of us, if Jesus was going to write it today, he would say, hey, when you pray, don't be like one of those hypocrites. 
When you pray, maybe in your small group afterwards, when you're done and you pray for each other, which is a good thing. When you pray and you're in a small group and you're in a circle and you're going to take turns and pray. When you pray like good Reformed or Presbyterian or Catholic people that you are decently and in good order. When you pray and everybody's taking a turn and you know it's four people from my turn. When you pray, don't do that thing where you're only thinking about what you're going to pray for when it gets to be your turn instead of praying with and for the person who's actually praying out loud right now don't do that thing jesus says because in that moment when you're just thinking about yourself and what you're going to pray for so that other people think that you're a good prayer you're being a hypocrite and it's just like standing out there on the street corners to be seen by others I love this line that John MacArthur said. He goes, you know, when we talk about being a hypocrite, we kind of mean, you know, saying one thing and doing another. But they actually had, they actually had a, uh, a technical term that Jesus was probably using, employing, when he said hypocrite. A hypocrite was somebody who actually stood on a stage, on an actor, and they would la- wear these kind of comically oversized masks so that everybody in the back, no matter how far you were, they could see who the character was that you're pretending to play. That was a hypocrite. And Jesus is going, that's what we do. That's what we do when we pray and we try to use fancy words. That's what we do, listen, whenever we pray for something, but our hearts are not lining up exactly with some of the words that we're about to say. And then Jesus, he ramps it up a notch, real intense now, and he kind of gives us the key to everything, all of it, how to pray and how to know that God hears you and answers you with, with 100% accuracy. He goes, verse, and he goes, truly I tell you, when you were playing, Uh, Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, he goes now, go into your room, close the door. It's a lot harder to pretend when it's just you and God. But it's still possible, believe me. And pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret, then he will reward you. I love this line about like praying to your Father who is unseen. Um, Because... Most of the time, John Ortberg writes this in a book about uh, the Lord's Prayer. Most of the time, the the gap gap that we have between how much we want to pray and kind of how much we do pray, that gap could really be filled with, with this idea that, like, the problem with prayer is that it's so intangible. Like, ever since, I don't know, enlightenment, we, we always kind of have this understanding that what you can feel, what you can touch, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can hear, like that's the stuff that matters. Only matter matters. And so when it comes to like the stuff in my life, that matters. Uh, My bike matters because I can touch it, I can ride on it. My car matters because I can ride in it even better. Uh, My house matters because I can live in it, right? My, My phone matters because I can feel it, I can touch it, I can hold it. I can laugh with it. I can do all kinds of stuff, right? It only matter matters. But he goes, maybe it would help, like, like fill in some of that gap if we realize something, that everything that matters and has matter didn't always have matter, but started as an idea in someone else's mind. So the bike, the car, the house, even the dream house, right? Like none of it starts with just being a house, being a bike, being a car. All of it starts as some idea in somebody's mind, a designer, an architect, and then they bring it into existence. Now apply that for just a minute onto your prayer life, where you actually get to go into the mind of the creator. And the Bible tells us that everything that has been created has been created out of nothing. Out of the very mind of God, he spoke and he formed everything and put it all together. And you get to go into the center of that being, into his mind, and you get to ask for whatever it is that you want to ask. Like, like think about that. Everything that has mattered and does matter started not from matter, but from an idea, from a mind, and you get to speak into that mind. If it helps, think about your phone. And think about whatever issue you might have with it or problem you might voice with it. And you could go ahead and get a software update or do something about it. But just imagine if you could go one deeper. Imagine if you could go into the very office or even into the very mind of the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, and you could say your piece or whatever you wanted to about your iPhone. 
Imagine the difference that it make. I would say that you could probably get your headphones port back again. If you, you could do that. Some of you Android people are like, see, that's why, but it's coming to you too. So just hang in there. The power of going into the mind of the creator, knowing that every single thing that has matter and does matter didn't start that way, but started as an idea. That's what it means to go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And Jesus continues. He goes, and when you pray, oh, this is so important, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. Remember last week we heard uh, pagans, not a derogatory term. Jesus is not like making fun of anybody. He's just simply pointing out that there's a lot of people who worship the Roman pantheon of gods, Jupiter, Zeus, Venus, etc. And those gods are far too busy to pay any attention to the people. So they feel like they have, to, they have to impress those gods in order to get any attention to them. Don't keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. No, no, no. don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask them. Don't be like them because your God is different. Don't be like the people that feel like they have to speak in a way that impresses their gods because that's the only way they're going to be heard. Don't be like them because, church, your God is different than all of them. Your God knows what you need before you even so Jesus is going to teach us a prayer. And many, of you, many of you have heard it before. If you grew up in a Catholic church, maybe you, uh, maybe you called it an Our Father. If you grew up in other churches, maybe you call it the Lord's Prayer. Many of you have heard it before in different ways, different translations, different sayings of a few different words, and that's okay. I'm just going to start it off, and you can kind of join in whenever you, whenever you want, or not at all. You can just kind of listen to other people around you, try to stumble for the words, get it wrong, maybe get a few things right along the way. But join in if you'd like. It goes like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Not everybody bats a thousand. That's all right. Uh, the, uh, now, there's a lot of different ways, like I said, about praying some of these things. Some of you said thine and die instead of you and yours, and that's okay. You told everybody you're a little more holy and get it right every time. That's okay. Some people say trespasses instead of deaths, and we paused and waited. That's all right, too. But as <laughs> we pray, as we pray through this thing, w- what happens and, and it's so important to get this right. In any talk about prayer, we have to kind of get the, the core concepts of this thing down. Because we're talking about how to pray and have God hear you every single time. Have God answer you, in fact, every single time. And what I'm gonna what I'm gonna put out there for you to consider this week or this season is that when you pray, you, you pray by not babbling. But like when you pray, you pray as a Christian and not a pagan. When you pray, you pray using the JDB style of prayer, which is just don't babble. Like, like mean the words that you're saying. And so what I want to offer you this morning is that when you pray this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and you go through it, don't just say the words, but, but say the words in order of what they're written here, and then stop if you get to a word that you don't know what it means, or stop When you get to a phrase that you think, I don't think I can really say that in good, clear conscience. Stop at a place that you're like, that's not really exactly, truly where my heart is. And just kind of like stay there before moving on. Because the Lord's Prayer is important. It's got two parts to it. Each part has three sections to it. This will be on the test later. Just kidding. The two parts are God and you, or God and all of us. And so the first three parts are about, like, our Father, you know, and then his location, like, who he is, location, right? Hallowed be your name. He's sacred. He's holy. And then it's your kingdom. And then it goes, give us, lead us, right? It goes from God to us. So don't move, don't move on into the us part until you, get, until you get the God part down first. Then we can move on. That's just kind of what I'm submitting to you today. But I have to point out, like the huge irony behind all of this, 
right, is that Jesus, he taught us this model on how to pray. And he didn't intend for it to be the be-all, end-all only prayer because he actually taught us this twice in Matthew chapter 6. And then Luke tells another story, another teaching in uh, Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, he uh, he, he records it as just like a little bit different. And so we know it's not just like this rote thing that you have to memorize and say exactly, but it's more of a structure or a model of how to pray and be heard by God and answered by God every single time. But what do we do with it? What do we just do with it? I mean, I broke the cadence a little bit because when we prayed and I've got the microphone, so I'm a little bit louder than everybody else. And so my mistakes are accentuated a little bit more, but that's okay. But like I pray and I did it a little bit quick and I kind of broke the cadence maybe or the rhythm that you're used to. And I'm guessing that some of you, many of you are in your chairs like, whoa, wait a second. Like he's going kind of quick. That's not how it's supposed to go. Right? Because we have taken that model of prayer that Jesus said in context is the one most important thing. If I could teach you one and only thing about praying is please, church, don't babble. Mean every word. And, and we take that and we're like, no, but now we're going to have a rhythm to the whole thing. And it's going to be very uncomfortable if we get a little bit out of that rhythm. And the irony behind what we have done with the Lord's Prayer compared to what Jesus intended for us to do with it to mean every word. To just hear every word and maybe make a note in your Bible or or make a note on on your pad, however you're writing it down, and just like, this is kind of where I am and these are the words that I can say and I can mean and these are the ones that I'm not really sure if I could say it without babbling, without my heart being behind it. Jesus starts off and he goes, this then is how you should pray. And he goes, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. How offensive it was then to pray our Father. You know, when they would write the name of God, they wouldn't even include the the vowels as they wrote it down because they believed that the name was, was, was too sacred to be able to be pronounced, and so they didn't want people to be able to pronounce it, so they dropped all the vowels out. It's just consonants. You can't actually say it out loud. And even then, when they wrote the consonants without the vowels, so you couldn't say it, they would still have a tradition where they would wash their hands in between before writing it and then after writing it and then keep on writing because that's the level of respect they had for the name. And then here's this rabbi who comes along, Jesus, who says, and when you pray, and the Aramaic word that he uses is, pray saying, our dad. And how offensive that would have landed on those ears to say, no, Dad? And even to us today, do do you know that that Timothy writes to us, the church, and he says that that God dwells in this immeasurable kind of like light at the center of it. And it's almost like the picture is this this nuclear blast you've seen on the the test sites of like the mushroom cloud that goes out and the the light ring that like shoots out to the wings. But, But it's like, it's not just one event that goes out, but it's like, it's just held and suspended there and God is somehow at the center of it. And in prayer, we like walk up to and into the center of that blast zone and we kinda like knock on the door and say, Dad, is it you? And we get, we get to do that. Our Father in heaven. You know, we think like heaven, it's somewhere there, out there. You know, if I were to ask, I'm not actually going to ask because I think I know the answer, but if I were to ask, like what would you guess is closer? Uh, heaven or the Grand Rapids South Chick-fil-A, just up the road. And for some of you, it's a trick question because the Grand Rapids South Chick-fil-A is heaven. And so I have respect for that answer. Tomorrow lunchtime, I see some applause. That's okay. Um, but like seriously, what's closer? I think it's interesting that when Jesus used that word heaven, he used a word that's used in three different ways. We have three different English words for it. And so we don't totally know outside of context what he meant when he said that. So on the first hand, when Jesus used heaven and other people said heaven, he meant there's like stars in the night sky that would kind of move around. Like that furthest place, that was, that was a heaven. But, but then they, that was a third heaven, they called it. But then there was like a, a second heaven or a closer heaven that was actually the sky Uh, is our word for it, because they saw these clouds moving, and like, well, the clouds are a lot, lot closer than the stars up in the sky, so they called that, like, heaven as well. But then they had a first heaven that was closer than all of those, which is, like, just the air all around them. In fact, 
the air that they, they breathed and, and filled up their lungs with, also called heaven. And I think if we were to ask Jesus, Jesus, when you meant that God occupies the space called heaven, did you mean space out there? Did you mean sky up there? Or did you mean the air in here? And I think the answer that Jesus would give is yes. Right? Because he is the being that dwells behind the furthest star, behind the furthest, furthest galaxy out there, but he's also the one that resides in every breath that we take. Our Father in heaven who is there and in heaven who is here, hallowed, sacred, worthy is your name. Someone asked one time, if God is so hallowed and sacred and worthy, why is it that he would demand to be praised and worshipped? And I think the answer is that not so much that he demands it, but that it's just, it's so rare that we come across a being who's so actually worth it. You know, imagine, um, imagine the last, um, uh, like, play or uh, orchestra uh, recital uh, that you went to. Uh, symphony doesn't doesn't matter, but something with a with a conductor, right? Who's got his back to to everybody, and he's you know doing the thing with the orchestra, and it's like everybody out there, you hold your applause until the very end, right? It's this unspoken rule that if you, by the way, didn't know, you hold your applause <laughs> to the end because everybody wants to make sure that they can enjoy every last second of it, every decibel of what's happening on stage. And so nobody says anything, breathes, you can hear a pin drop at some points in that auditorium until that moment when the conductor turns around and then everybody jumps up, that is if they're worth it, and stands to their feet and claps and shouts and praises because they were worth it. John Orberg writes on this, and he says, I think the worst imaginable part for the atheist and the unbeliever is having all of the praise and thankfulness and gratitude kept inside of them, but not having anyone to express that to, no conductor to turn around and to receive the applause and the acclaim, hallowed be your name. And then he gets to the hardest part where I think many of us just kind of stop if we're going to try not to babble. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom, your will on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't it true that I've got a kingdom and you've got a kingdom doesn't it kind of seem true that, like, I'm the king of my kingdom and you're the queen of your kingdom? And isn't it entirely frustrating when people don't totally recognize that you're the king of your kingdom or the queen of your kingdom and they don't act like subjects within your kingdom? <laughs> they don't do what you expect them to do or want them to do, and so you get frustrated with them because they're not, like, falling in line. I think one of the hardest things, one of the most unnatural things that we can do is surrender to God's kingdom to God's will and to say, no, no, yours, not mine. I take my kingdom, I take everything that I have at my disposal, no, and I surrender it. Not to me, I surrender it. It's yours. It's one small part of your greater kingdom. I'll tell you, at my best and at my worst, at my best, no matter what it is, I can kneel down before God and I can say, you know what? Your kingdom is bigger than my kingdom. I get that. At my best, I can lay down and I can say, God, your will is higher than my will, and I'm okay with that. So take my will and take my kingdom and, and fit into yours because I know you are inexhaustibly bigger and better than I am. It's just that the issue is I haven't seen me at my best yet. <laughs> but at my worst, I have. But at my worst, I'm saying, no, no, God, I'm not asking you to break the rules, not for me. I would never ask that of you, God. I'm a preacher after all. I'm just asking you to maybe bend the rules a little bit. Maybe bend your kingdom a little for my kingdom. Maybe bend your will just a little bit for my will. God, if you could just do it my way just this one time, I would be eternally grateful. God, just come on over this way and just do this one thing for me. If you could just, if I could just kind of faith him over and just bring him over to my way, that would just be this one time and then I'll let it go just this once. God, would you please? having lunch earlier this week with a friend of mine. 
you know, he just kind of randomly brings up, he goes, hey, did I ever tell you um, about my son? This is a perfect example of this. And I'm going, no, I don't know your son. What do you, and he goes, yeah, I don't, you know, I guess I never told you that story before, but when he was born, um, he was born with a heart defect on both sides of his heart, which is very complicated to operate on. And it was a series of surgeries that they could only do one at a time. And so he said, what they had to do is they do a surgery, let him recover, and then do another one, let him recover, do another one. <laughs> Except for after the first surgery, it did not go well. And this is a kid, mind you, who is days old. And, and because of the fluid retention and surgery and all of the things that went wrong, he swelled up to seven pounds. And they're waiting and they're watching and at one point, the doctor, the surgeon comes to him, and they said, before we do the next operation, we would have to wait for him to get better and stronger. But I would like to be honest with you and tell you that there is no medical reason why we would ever expect him to make it through tonight. So take the time that you need and be with him. And a friend of mine, he told me the hardest prayer that he and his wife had ever had to pray. He had to pray, God, I know that you love life. And God, I know that you love little baby boys and girls. And I know that you love healthy, strong, beating hearts. You made eight billion of them after all. But God, how would you choose to be glorified in this? To pray with faith, but then also to ask Jesus, how would you choose to be glorified? Your will, not my will, be done. I'll tell you, for many of us, I think that's the place where we get this week. That's the line that we say, I don't know if I can make it past that. I don't know if I can bend or break myself hard enough in line enough to go over to God's way, to go over to God's will, knowing what it might entail. But if you could, if you could, then you made it out of that God section the first part of the prayer, and you get to move on to the us, to the me, to the I. You get to move on to what is often thought of as a reward. After you gave God his, then you get yours, which is this. Give us, yes. Give us today our daily bread. That's all. Because I think if we're being honest and we're, and we're, and we're doing this, JDB style, just don't babble, and we're going to pray words that we only mean, we don't mean just the bread. Or if we mean bread, we mean like, okay, but like bread for tomorrow then too, right? And bread for last, and then bread for the retirement plan, and the bread for the college fund, and bread for somewhere nice to live, right? I mean, we're talking about a little more than just today's bread, and Jesus goes, no, this is what you should ask for, just bread today. I came across this line earlier this week that I just loved it. It says that God promised to supply your every need. So if you don't have it today, God in his wisdom decided you didn't need it today, so go ahead and get on with today. And I thought, can we pray that? JDB style, just don't babble. Can we pray that and mean that? And if you can, you get to move on and you get to pray what we all just kind of murmured out, not thinking about the words. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do you realize we just linked these things? We just linked the forgiveness that we receive from God to the forgiveness that we extend to other people. And I'm going, no, I don't want to pray that. I don't want to pray that and mean it. 
God, I was just praying that because you told us this is how to pray. I understand how the world is going to be different if we actually live that out. But God, you got to understand that's not something that I actually want to happen because names and faces are coming to mind of people who offended me and I don't want to give up my right to be angry at them. I want to nurse that anger. I want to nurse that bitterness. In fact, I made a little room in my heart for them. I put a futon in there, gave them the Wi-Fi password. They were on Netflix, right? They're just settled in. They're not going anywhere. And God is going, you don't think I have your name? You don't think I have your face popping up in mine with all the ways that you have offended me? God, I just want to babble. And then we get finally to the end where he goes, and finally, lead us not into temptation. Not that anybody has made it this far. Lead us not into temptation because we can do it all by ourselves. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or maybe it's just deliver us from evil. It it could go either way, honestly, the word that's translated there. Deliver us from evil. If we are 100% honest, I think that there's no possible way, there's no human earthly way outside of Jesus to pray the Lord's Prayer, not babbling, and to mean every word. Which is why, personally, I find so much hope and so much restoration into that last line. Because if you cannot, and I don't think any of us can, pray and mean truly, heartfully, the entire Lord's Prayer, if you can't make it all the way through your kingdom, your will, just bread, forgive us as we forgive, if we make it all the way through the end, great, for the the 100% rest of us, may I submit just praying this last line, Jesus, deliver me. Jesus, save me. This is a true story of, uh, of this dad that um, who's just so, he's got a 10-year-old son at home, and he's just so frustrated with some of the behavior that the 10-year-old exhibits, which is understandable. I mean, 10-year-olds can be a little bit rough at times, but he's just like, it seems so simple to me to make better choices. And every time he does something, he gets into trouble and he gets his mom mad at him and I get mad at him and he gets things taken away and timeouts and it just, it never goes well for him. And so he decides, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna like, I'm, I'm gonna sketch out on a napkin to my 10-year-old son, just like the process of decision-making. And this is, I made it nice and big so everybody can see it. You guys can see it, right? Okay, I'm from a generation, I will never see this and not think the flux capacitor from Back to the Future. But like, that's just me. You can Google that later. Um, He's like talking to his son and he sketches this out and you're like, okay, this is you, right? And you're kind of going up and you're making some decisions and kind of life is, is okay, that's fine. And then you get to this critical decision point of when you have to make a decision of whether you're going to go like this way and it's a good decision and you move towards God and towards restoration and towards healing and probably towards wholeness, or you can make this decision and you go towards bad things and you get things taken away and you get your mom mad at you and I get mad at you and it just, it doesn't work out for you ever. And then he goes, this is the decision that you have to make right here. Which way are you going to choose? Are you going to do a good decision and move towards God or a bad decision and move towards bad things. And his son, get this, he's 10 years old, and he takes the napkin, and he goes, yeah, Dad, I mean, you're mostly right, except for it isn't actually like this. And he takes the napkin, and he turns it 90 degrees, and he goes, it's more like this, where I get to this critical decision-making And I know that I can make a good choice and go up here towards God or a bad choice and go down here towards bad things. But Dad, i got to be honest with you, and I want to tell you, it's always easier to go downhill. And as he thought about this and how true his son was, how right his son was, and he goes, this path is always so much easier than going up this road. And I know I can see that, but I see like the road that it takes and it's just too much for me. And it's just so easy to kind of just stumble your way. Gravity does most of the work, Dad, right? And you just kind of fall down this path. And he goes, and here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. He goes, once you go down this road a little bit, even if you don't end up here yet, once you go down just a little bit of this road, you look behind you and the path to get up here isn't a straight line, but you got to go all the way back up the bad road. And then you got to start going 
up the good road after that. He goes, I'm down here, and after I've already made that choice, Dad, listen, this just seems impossible. So if God and good things are up here and bad and bad things are down here, I just don't think I can do it. This is true, by the way. And many of you parents have taught it to your kids, and I hope it, it landed for you as well. Because many of you have, have learned this the hard way. But the part about this thing that isn't true is the path that gets from here up to here. Because the kid looks at it and he goes, it's impossible to start climbing back up this road and then back up this road. The part of that that isn't true is that it isn't gospel. The road isn't just traveling up on your own. And we know that because Christmas is next week. And Christmas is the time that we're celebrating the prophecy of Isaiah. In Isaiah 7, he says that a virgin will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. And the angel spoke to the Virgin Mary and spoke the words that the people, they're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Jesus, before he would ascend forever on high after his ministry and after his death and after his resurrection, he would say, and surely I am with you, Emmanuel, to the very end of the age. Jesus says, I'm not just here. I'm not just here. I'm not at the place before you screwed up. I am not only at the place after you've made all those good decisions. I am not only restricted to the place where you've messed up and you thought, I can never make my way back again. I am Emmanuel. I am in it all. You can't be on this chart without finding me journeying right next to you. But Emmanuel? Emmanuel is just what they call me. My name is going to be Jesus. My name, when I come out, when I'm born, they're going to name me Jesus, which means Savior, which means Deliverer. They're going to call me Emmanuel because I'm always with you everywhere, no matter if it was before you picked up the bottle, before you visited the website, before you made the mistake, before you said the thing, before you harbored resentment, or after. I am with you, but you will also call me Jesus, my name, because I am the one who picks you up and carries you back up that road and then drags you, maybe kicking and screaming, back up to the place of God. You can call me Emmanuel because I am with you, but please, my name. Name is Jesus because I will save you. If there is something that you need to be delivered from, saved from, pull out this card and the seat back in front of you. Maybe put the prayer request down behind it if you have it. Or maybe just fill out that box that says that I made Jesus my Savior deliverer today. Or I renewed my relationship with Jesus, my Savior, my deliverer today. During this last song, we have a prayer team set up in back. We would love to pray with you. If you feel the burden to pray with people on an ongoing basis, go to the team in the back and just say, I want to be on this team. I want to pray for people. I want to be at that place where somebody finds Jesus and gets pulled back up towards God. I want to invite you to stand up and let's pray together. Gracious God, you are the one who saves. You are the one who delivers. God, we admit to you, we have so little, in fact, nothing to offer you in this transaction. To offer anything to the creator of all would be an insult. But God, all of our faults and all of our failures, all of our sin, all of our mistakes, all of our regrets, we hand that over to you. And we say, make something beautiful with this. Save us. Deliver us. May your kingdom come in heaven and on earth. Jesus, we pray all of this in your holy and your righteous name. Amen.